Well, it gives me great pleasure to be able to introduce to you our next president. Dr. Teresa LaMasters will be our 36th president. Dr. LaMasters received her undergraduate degree at South Dakota State University, followed by medical school at the University of South Dakota School of Medicine. She did her general surgery training at the University of Kansas School of Medicine in Wichita, and then her fellowship in minimal invasive and bariatric surgery at Stanford University. She is currently a clinical adjunct faculty associate professor through the University of Iowa. She has distinguished herself through a variety of committee obligations in the AASMBS, including work on access to care, pediatric surgery, diversity and inclusion, and public education, just to name a few. She was the first president of the Iowa chapter of the ASMBS in 2015 and has distinguished herself through her contributions through MBSA QIP by being a site surveyor and being on the Standards and Verification Committee. She continues all of this while she uh, is still the medical director of bariatrics at Unity Point Clinic in Des Moines, Iowa. I've had the privilege of getting to know her personally over the last several years. And she is an enophile. And for those of you who are not familiar with that term, Robin, it is a lover of wine. <laughs> and here she is with her family when she visited my wife and I uh, in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Her husband, Eric, is quite a sommelier himself. And it was uh, also privileged uh, to meet her two sons, John and Peter, who are arguably some of the most emotionally intelligent teenagers I have ever met. You should be quite proud of them, Teresa. Teresa's passion for community practice surgeons, her dedication to ASMBS, and her innate drive will serve her well in her presidency. Please join me in welcoming your new president, Dr. Teresa LaMasters. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you, Dr. Katari, for that very kind introduction. I want to thank you as well for your outstanding leadership over the past year. I will tell you, this job is a very difficult uh, job that takes a lot of time, and Dr. Katari has done an outstanding job. So I think we need to give him another round of applause. So I have learned so much from Dr. Kathari and his outstanding leadership, but also from the entire executive committee of the executive council. And Dr. Matt Hutter and Dr. Marina Kirian are here as well. Um, we really have an outstanding leadership team, and I want you to understand that this really is a team effort. It's not just one person. And now we get the great, wonderful opportunity to have Dr. Ann Rogers join us as well on our executive committee uh, leadership team. So. I want to tell you that no one gets to this place alone. And I want to thank two of my great mentors and friends who were escorting me to the stage. Um, I stand on the shoulders of giants. Not just those two, but so many in the room here who have come before me to show me the way, but also have been willing to turn around and give me a hand and help me understand a path forward. So I really want to thank them that they were willing to share their time, their expertise, and their talent with me. So I also want to thank those who walk beside me. And a lot of them are right up here in the front, but many of them are scattered throughout this room too. Um, they're my peers, my friends, who are always willing to, to work right beside me along the way. And then I also want to thank those who are coming up behind me, who continue to push us forward, to stretch us, to say, we need to continue to do better every day. And I want to thank the members. I will tell you that we are a unique society, and the fact that the members, all of you in here, elect the leadership. 
And I want to tell you that's extremely humbling and such an honor to have my peers and my friends and my colleagues trust me with this opportunity to be the next steward and president of our society. I want to tell you that the strength of our society is in the talent and the dedication of our members. So I'll tell you the engine of our society really is the committees. We have 23 committees who are actively doing work for our members and our patients every single day. So I want to take a minute here to recognize some of those people. I want to thank the committee chairs and the co-chairs. So if you're in the room, I'd like you to stand and be recognized, please. Stand up. All right, wait, 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 stay standing, stay standing. Okay, so now I wanna thank all of the members who serve on committees, because these are very, very important people as well. So it's not just the people who maybe are uh, in the leadership limelight, it's the people in the trenches doing the work every day. So if you're on a committee, please stand up. Thank you so much. Now you can sit down. Okay. But I really want to thank you because um, we have some of the most amazing, bright, talented people there are in the world in our society. And I want to thank them each for sharing their time and their talent. And it takes sacrifice to give that time and talent to the society while your family's at home. Uh, a lot of this work is done at nights, weekends, holidays, and I really want to thank you for that as well. So again, I'm very humbled and honored uh, to be chosen by the members um, to serve as the next steward of the society and as the president. I want you to know that this is my surgical home and you are my family. And I'm so happy and excited to have this opportunity to lead and to serve uh, with you. So I hope we'll all see you all again in person coming up in November for the ASMBS weekend. And I hope you all have a great time tonight as well because we work hard, but we also play hard. Congratulations, Dr. LeMasters. Not only do we have a passing of the gavel, uh, which is, obviously, oh, hold on. <laughs> all right, but I have, um, picked myself up a past president ribbon and got you a president ribbon. So, thank you. Hello there, my name is Matt Hutter. I'm the immediate past president of the ASMBS, and I had the distinction of not having all this last year with our virtual world that we were living in, and it's so nice to be here in person. Uh, it's just wonderful, the energy that I see, the joy that I see seeing friends, making new friends, and, uh, and being here as the ASMBS alone um, has a certain uh, specialness to it as well. We're all here treating one disease, and we're all treating it with, uh, with, with, with surgery, and um, so very happy to be here, happy to be here with everyone. As the immediate past president, uh, one of the privileges I have is to introduce our president. Now you know Shonel, you know, love Shonel. I'll tell you a little bit more about Shonel before he, he uh, gives his presidential address. And there we go. So first of all, Teresa mentioned this before, but the, um, the ASMBS, your vote really does matter. There's almost no surgical society or other medical society where the membership actually vote. Yeah, sure, a lot of times they click a button and there's one choice. There's not one choice here. There are at least three choices for every position. That means you have your voice. You can change what the future looks like. Our future looks very bright uh, with Teresa coming up. And, our and in a future after that with Marina and then Anne looks very bright and very different than it did in the past. And that's what we're all about. Uh, with, our, with, our, with the ASMBS, but it's all about you. So next time that ballot comes out there, vote. You vote for the executive committee. And here you have the, the executive council of the, the, uh, that's listed here. 
and uh, all elected members. This was at our retreat, an in-person retreat that we had in Charleston, South Carolina. Rana Pilat was uh, generous to share his, his family and his home for us. There's Peg and George Ann. George Ann, we miss you. And everybody needs to come to the Lead Gal event to celebrate uh, George Ann's accomplishments. Christy, Jenny are all there. But here are your elected EC members that are listed there. We look forward to having uh, a Helmuth Billy and Mona Misra join us on the EC this year. And so welcome to you both. Now of that, the ECEC is the executive committee of the exec executive council. And so the executive committee is the immediate past president, the president, the president elect, and the president elect elect. This group we've spent for the past four years at least an hour and a half every Wednesday with many more <laughs> ad hoc meetings. There's a lot of time and a lot of service and a lot of friendships that develop because of this. And I've been privileged to serve along both Shonel and Teresa and Marina this past year. Again, your vote matters because you, you decide who goes into these positions. Not only is it a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. And that's a common theme that Teresa brought up that we'll talk about more as well. So I'm introducing Shonel. Uh, Shonel Katari is the ASMBS president 2021 to 2022, the 30, 35th president that we've had at this institution. And many of you already know and love Shonel, and hopefully I'll tell you just a little bit more about him. Um, born in Hamilton, Ohio. His father is a family medicine physician from India, and his mother is a nurse from the US. He's a middle child, has two siblings. You can see his siblings as well as his parents in this picture here. He's married to Peg, who we're honored to have here tonight, and has been a constant uh, a joy throughout all of our meetings whenever she's present. She's a nurse practitioner, been married for 23 years. Two children, Brittany and Samantha. Samantha is here today. Brittany unfortunately cannot because she's working as a medical scribe and could not get a day off. <laughs> but Samantha, it's, it's wonderful for you here to join us in, uh, in showing our love for Shano. Early years. Uh, so <laughs> Shuttle was uh, raised in Fairbury, Illinois, and as far as I can tell, the biggest thing in, about Fairbury, Illinois is that water tower. It's 1.8 miles squared, um, and the population is 3,700 and holding. Um, so there's Shuttle. Apparently the sink is just as good as a bathtub, and uh, some pictures from the early years, as you can see there. And uh, early on, a love for boats. I'm not really sure where he found the water near Fairbury, but he, he developed a love for boats early on. Um, but he also had a wonderful role model. His dad, a family practitioner, and he wanted to dress like his dad, he wanted to be like his dad. He would go for house calls with his dad. He would carry the black bag for his dad. And, um, and it's just been a wonderful role model. And, uh, we're very happy for that. So thank you for your father, thank you for your mother, and thank you for what you do. The tween and teen years are always a little bit more awkward, of course, uh, especially for us who grew up in the 80s, and uh, so that's always a little bit of a challenge. Um, I had that same middle part, and the middle part, I guess, is back again now for the teenagers. Now things go around full circle. Uh, the hair, yep, the hair, and the, the mustache. I think this was the first time that Top Gun came out where they were sporting that mustache, and now 36 years later, it's back in, so you're ahead of your time. The facial hair hasn't gone, the goatee has come along, uh, but there is in the, uh, the, the tween and teen years. His education, uh, very distinguished, Anderson University in Anderson, Indiana. He then moved on to medical school in Peoria, Illinois. Uh, followed by a residency in La Crosse, Wisconsin, uh, where he went to the Gunderson Health System. Following that, he did a fellowship at um, uh, Virginia Commonwealth and, uh, in Richard, Richmond, Virginia. And I think this is also something that's very important to him, this idea of this bariatric lineage and, uh, and the roots where, that he's grown from. As far as I can tell, and people can correct me later, hopefully not here on stage, uh, this line of, of lineage here with Harvey Sugarman, Sugarman as a president in uh, 2004 to 2005, and then Eric, who worked with Harvey and also helped uh, train Shonel in 2018, 2000. Now the third president, the grandchild of the, uh, of the, of the presidency and the lineage uh, from 2021 to 2022. That, uh, uh, lineage is a, here's a picture of, of Harvey uh, along with his wife Betsy and of course Peg with, with Shonel. And uh, we miss Harvey, and, but this, his life grows on, not only in S.W.O.R.D., but it goes on with the lineage that he has developed throughout. 
Here's a picture of Harvey with Eric and some of the early fellows. It's not all the fellows because this, this goes on and on. I think there was a plus 28 that we saw with regards to this, but a picture at least with Seanal, uh, Corey McBride, and Muhammad Ali uh, back in the day. And here's a list of them in front of this ASMBS family tree. So if you're down in the exhibit hall, you'll see this lineage and family tree. People are encouraged to write names. You can see Seanal right there writing down Sugarman goes to Di Maria, and then it goes to Katari, and then Katari's writing out. Now we have great grandbabies, I think was the term, that's, uh, that's coming up along that way. And I know that Eric's line went straight up and said plus 28, and, I don't <laughs> and goes on from there as well. Uh, but a, a great tradition as our tree grows, and, uh, and something to be proud of, and I know this has meant a lot to Seanal and everybody who's trained with him, and that he's been able to train and pass along that torch. So uh, since his fellowship, he was at Gunnarsson, went back to La Crosse where he did his, uh, his um, uh, residency training. Uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin, you can see here in the west part of, uh, of the state. And uh, was there for until 2019, where he decided to join his friend, Dr. John Scott, uh, down in Greenville, South Carolina at Prisma Health. Uh, Vice Chair of Medical Affairs when he was brought on, but sure enough, Seanal goes on to greatness and is now the Chief of Surgery there, um, down at uh, Prisma Health down there. Really the quadruple threat. I mean, we talk about the triple threat, threat in academic medicine, research, teaching, clinical care. You know, the three-legged stool tends to fall over, it doesn't have a place to sit, uh, but administrative leadership is, the nothing, is something that's very important, um, something that's been part of his, his, uh, his present, his future, and also his, uh, his legacy here. He did develop the leadership, consul, uh, the leadership conference for the fellows at the ASMBS Reunited, which was tremendously well received, and leadership roles not only here, Southwestern Surgical, Fellowship Council, his roles at his institutions. Uh, he is of greatness and will be of greatness. We'll have a lot more to give back to surgery and to surgical patients because of the four legs of that stool. But for Seanal, family comes first. Married to Peg, this is when they eloped uh, in Hawaii a few years ago. <laughs> I probably should have put a date on that one, uh, but it's okay. Look at that handsome uh, uh, group there. This is with Peg, Brittany, Samantha. Uh, so Brittany, the, the older child, Samantha, who is, we have the pleasure to, uh, to have here today, um, uh, are shown here, a beautiful family. Here they are with Max, the family dog, who is a big part of the family as well recently passed in February, so he's, he's missed, um, but he, he had a lot to give to the family as well. And here they are recently, uh, most recently, at uh, Brittany's graduation from Bethel, and uh, you can see here the, the happy family with the recent graduate, and on to greatness for the kids as well. Along with family, faith is very important for Seanal as well. So Anderson University, Seanal's college, academic and Christian discovery is a theme with regards to that. Mission work has been important for him, working with Mountaintop Ministries in Haiti and uh, in Bible studies you know, class uh, uh, teaching. So leading weekly Bible study classes at his local church for years up in La Crosse, Wisconsin. It's a big part of, of, of Seanal. But fun is also a big part of Seanal now. And I think people who know and love Seanal appreciate that as well. Boating has been fun for him, the captain of the ship. Um, he never had a, a boy, but now he has two. Max was with the dog, was one boy, and Maximus was his boat, and that was his other son, and love uh, as well. He's not in the big boat right now, but in a li little boat, but I think there's a bigger boat in his future, as I can imagine. <laughs> I don't know if everyone's shaking their hand or nodding, nodding over there. <laughs> Um, but boating has been important to him, but just having fun with family, with the Packers, with a smile on his face, with his selfie stick hanging out there. You can see that right arm is out in most of these pictures because he's taking the pictures himself. And, uh, and there's always a smile, not just on his face, but on everybody's face that he's with. And that's a, a theme throughout. So smile if you're in an elevator, everyone's smiling. Halloween, they're smiling. And... There he goes. <laughs> he brings the fun with him. And I think tonight, uh, if you are present tonight um, at the After Dark party, you'll be seeing him in action. So I want to raise a toast. We'll have a toast tonight at the gala event. A toast, we'll toast, we'll toast Georgianne tonight. Um, and I, I hope everybody's there for that. But we'll give an extra special toast for, uh, for, for, uh, for, uh, for Seanal as well, with a selfie stick out, with a smile on his face. He's been the captain of our ship. We thank you, Peg, for sharing, uh, and we thank you, Seanal, for your work.
this is the ceremonious mason medal. It is that heavy, <laughs> so you can't wear it forever. Uh, but this is for you, Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much, Matt. Wow, I, maybe in the interest of time, that was pretty good. We just call, call it right now and go to lunch, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Well, first of all, welcome back. It's great to see everybody in person at our annual ASMBS meeting. These are my disclosures. They really shouldn't impact my talk. Let's see, can we, yeah, there we go. Um, other than the 80s music will uh, affect this talk. Um, and all of my former fellows know that the, the, the hemostatic properties of the 80s music in the operating room. So other than that, um, you can see the other only other disclosure I have is um, even though those pictures, believe it or not, were taken three years apart, even though I'm wearing the same shirt, um, <laughs> I don't I don't buy that expensive wine like that. But it was a gift from Dr. Lemasters, who ever said, "If you ever win the presidency, I'm going to get you that bottle." And she is a woman of her word. So the other disclosure is I don't um, I'm not going to use any of these words because I don't talk like this. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, now, it's truly an honor to stand here before you today as president. And this is obviously the highest achievement in my professional career. I certainly never dreamed I would be president of the ASMBS. After all, I don't have the grit of a Robin Blackstone. I don't have the energy of a Raoul Rosenthal. And I certainly don't have the hair of Matt Hutter. Matt, it is. <laughs> truly presidential. I don't know how you just wake up when it looks like that. I mean, you just get right on Air Force One. I don't get it. So, But early in my career, I used to stare in awe and admiration of those who occupied these first few rows during this address. And now I know the sacrifice and dedication it took for them to achieve such a title. But I do want to encourage the next generation of leaders within the ASMBS. Because did you go to a public high school? Did you attend a college that most have never heard of? Did you complete your residency in a location that most thought of as flyover country? If so, well then, we have something in common. Because that is my educational pedigree. And it provided me with an exceptional educational and training experience that I would not trade for the world. I share this with you because I know that many of you are in the audience today can relate. And some of you will have the opportunity to stand here someday and to sit in these first three rows as well. And I look forward to your contributions to the field and the society in the years to come. And as I've always said, and some of you have heard me say this, that academia is a mindset. Do not let your institution define how much or how little scholarly contributions to the field that you can contribute to. After all, don't forget the origins of both Beartick and milling invasive surgery predominantly came from the private sector. Speaking of academic contributions, I would like to recognize Ann Rogers as our newly elected secretary, treasurer, and future president. <laughs> this picture was taken one hour into my term. It was her best first lady impression. But Anne, you are truly president material, and I look forward to working with you over the next year. Now, I would like to take a few moments to thank several people who have helped me to get to this position. First, I want to thank my parents who inspired me to pursue a career in medicine. My father, a retired family physician, and my mother, nurse, they worked side by side in his uh, rural clinic practice for 30 years. I would also, again, like to thank my wife, Peg, for the incredible sacrifices that she made over the years due to the time commitments of this leadership position. Now, this is the usual time in a presidential address where one describes how much they love their spouse. But I will not do that, because love is not a big enough word to describe the feelings that I have for her. Hmm. Now, for those of you yeah, who did grow up a child of the 80s, I want you to know that I did, in fact, get Jesse's girl.
I also want to thank my two daughters, Brittany and Samantha, whose many activities and life events I've missed out on because of my obligations as a surgeon and society leader. I'm thankful for the amazing family vacations we've taken over the years, and hopefully they partially make up for my absence in some way. I also want to thank our current executive committee, Drs. LeMasters, Curian, and Hutter, my accountability partners, who have been great confidants over this past year. I'd also like to thank the Executive Council, the true governing body of ASMBS. I appreciate their insights and their systems of checks and balances within the leadership structure of our great society. This past year, we celebrated Georgianne Mallory's well-deserved retirement from our Executive Director after her 25 years of service to the ASMBS. Georgianne's leadership over the years contributed significantly to the success of ASMBS. But I also want to thank Christy Kaufman, our Interim Executive Director, for her friendship and guidance over this past year as well. I only have two phone numbers saved in my favorites, my wife's and Christy's, and I think you know which one, sadly, I call more. <laughs> she has done an incredible job stepping into the Executive Director role in George Ann's absence. Now, the Executive Committee is merely the tip of the iceberg. Christy and the rest of the ASMBS staff are the ones who work tirelessly to help us fulfill our mission every day. My thanks also to Nate San, President of Integrated Health, for his honesty and forthrightness in his correspondence with me this past year. Hopefully we can continue to improve the relations between our surgeon members and NIH colleagues in the years to come. I also want to thank our program committee chair, Mona Misra, and co-chair Ann Rogers for putting together such an outstanding program. They are truly to be congratulated. I also want to thank my first chairman of surgery out of my fellowship, Dr. Bill Boyd, who formerly worked with Dr. Ed Mason in Iowa. He helped me build my Baratig program when I started my practice at the Gunderson Clinic in La Crosse, Wisconsin 21 years ago. And as you can see from the original brochure which he gave me upon his retirement, we have made significant strides in moving the decimal on mortality. I now call it refining the decimal. As we have developed a field of surgery in the past 50 years that has the safety profile rivaling gallbladder surgery. 22 years ago, I took a leap of faith and embarked on a fellowship in minimally invasive bariatric surgery under the guidance of Eric DiMaria. I had the privilege of being the first fellow at the Medical College of Virginia, now Virginia Commonwealth University, and little did I know what an adventure was in store for me. Dr. DeMarie and I have developed a great friendship over the years that continues to this day. And during my fellowship, I also had the privilege of working with the late Harvey Sugarman, who went on to be a great friend and mentor until his passing. Now, who would have thought in this picture taken in the operating room in 2000 would be the culmination of three future presidents of the ASMBS, myself, Dr. DeMaria, and Dr. Sugarman. I certainly had no idea at that time in my career that I would have the privilege of standing before you today. And to all the former fellows that I had the privilege of training, you are really the highlight of my CV. I'm so proud of all that you have achieved. I hope you're as proud of your training lineage as I am. I'm very proud of the pedigree that I have come from and have helped to train as well. Our Bertrick family tree is large, but it is also very tight knit. I hope you've taken advantage to place yourself within the proud lineage of our ASMBS family tree that we are creating in the marketplace in the exhibit hall. And if not, I encourage all of you in attendance to do so prior to the end of this meeting so that we can document your proud training history within our specialty. Speaking of my former fellows, I want to thank two of my former fellows turned partners, Drs. Matt Baker and Brandon Grover. I can honestly say that I built my career on the backs of these two gentlemen who supported me faithfully as I did my best to stand up for smaller community programs. We have two photos. One we're smiling, which we put up when we interviewed the fellows, and then we put this one up when they actually showed up for their job. <laughs> I would be gone highlighting the quality of the work and training done in the more rural and community centers in America through the countless lectures, accepted presentations, and leadership opportunities 
They covered my patients in my absence and occasionally re-explored them when I'd be at meetings such as this touting our great outcomes. They have both served our country and our humble servants of the field and faithful attenders and contributors to ASMBS. They represent all that we should strive to be within the ASMBS family. Doctors Grover, Baker, and I, we had a good run together. But much like the movie The Sandlot, some things can't last forever. Dr. Baker returned to his roots in Utah, and then one spring day, I received a phone call asking why I lived in Wisconsin, as there was an opportunity for me in South Carolina. So I went home to contemplate this offer. <laughs> I ultimately said goodbye to my partners and fellow cheeseheads, packed my bags, <laughs> and moved to Greenville, South Carolina. Dr. Grover was a little disappointed, but it was great to know my former program not only survived, but thrived in my absence under the direction of him and two of our other former fellows, Drs. Kate Mellian and Josh Pfeiffer. I do miss all of them, but we also know the joy of meetings like this provides an opportunity to catch up. I also want to thank John Scott and the rest of my current partners, who in my somewhat biased opinion now as chair of surgery, make up the strongest MIS division in the US. I also want to thank my staff, who somehow manage my patients and schedule with my busy travel schedule. This photo was taken two minutes into me practicing this speech with them. <laughs> <laughs> Last but not least, I must recognize Nikki Moore, my administrative assistant. She's a speech buffer and professional eye roller who manages my hectic calendar and attempts to keep me on task and my toes. She goes above and beyond to make me look good and successful. Her southern hospitality is what really convinced Peg and I to make the move to South Carolina. I would not be able to manage my life without her, and yes, she added that paragraph to my address but it's all true. <laughs> I also want to thank the 85 members who rolled up their sleeves and joined committees this year. I look forward to all the contributions you will make in the years to come. Time does not permit me to thank and comment on all 23 committees and the amazing contributions they have made to the society this past year. However, I would like to take a moment to highlight some of their accomplishments. Doctors Crawford and the Insurance Committee uh, have created an, an updated Veritic coding toolkit which is available on our website around primary codes and unlisted codes. This provides a valuable framework for our members as well as program managers around coding principles. Doctors Martin and Dan, on behalf of the Veritic Surgery Training Committee, launched a fellow lecture series for current fellows hiding a diverse group of ASMBS thought leaders. This rich educational opportunity is valuable not only to our fellows, but to our members as well. If you have not participated in some of these lectures, I'd encourage you to do so. There's an incredible amount of work that went into this in a short amount of time, and they are to be congratulated for this. This committee also helped navigate the certification process for our fellows when clinical volume was impacted by the COVID pandemic. The military committee, chaired by Dr. Brockmeyer, has been instrumental in getting MBSA QIP penetrants within the Department of Defense and increased participation from those centers. They most recently developed a surgical telementoring program at the Naval Medical Center in San Diego and are planning to expand this initiative to other centers as well. In addition, we continue to offer military discounts to our men and women in uniform, which allows more to attend. If this is still a barrier to any of you, please out, reach out to me and I will personally cover the difference so you may attend our in-person meetings in years to come. Our communications committee, led by Neil Flock, has resurrected the SWORD Journal Club and made it a live webinar with audience participation. They have expanded the ever-growing visual abstracts and continue to add new and younger members to this committee with innovative ideas. They have started a campaign, which many of you may have seen in build-up to this meeting, promoting our newest members. Our Access to Care Committee, led by Mickey Seeger, has seen several wins in this ever-important aspect of our society. This past year, we saw increased coverage for the SADS procedure, and the Federal Employee Health Benefits determined that all federal plans should cover medical obesity treatment options, including pharmacotherapy. 
We saw state employee benefits coverage wins in Louisiana, Georgia, and Arkansas, only leaving three states, including my own in South Carolina, without state employee coverage. Their team will double down their efforts this next year on these last remaining states. Finally, they continue to support the passage of the Treat and, Re Treat and Reduce Obesity Act at the national level. Our Clinical Issues Committee, led by Dan Eisenberg, had many publications on behalf of our membership this past year as listed on the slide. They continue to be extremely productive in their scholarly contributions and have already received their marching orders for next year's assignments based on the call for statements and our membership. The Public Education Committee, ran by Dr. Ryan Lehman, released the much anticipated Patient Informational Seminar slide deck, which is now available to all our members. This can be used as part of your informational seminar or can be incorporated into an online format for patient review at their leisure. Any portion of the slide deck can be incorporated into your current patient-facing materials. Our Diversity Inclusion Committee, led by Monique Hassan, developed the This Is Me project, highlighting 10 videos posted on our ASMBS social media accounts and developed a diversity session here at our annual conference. The Research Committee, under the direction of Dr. Stephanides, continues to be very active with three research projects accepted for presentation here in Dallas and awarded two recent grants, uh, research grants to our current members. Now I would like to take time to highlight some initiatives I feel deserve some extra attention. I have never aspired to be the president of anything, but I have always aspired to be a better leader in my home, the boardroom, the operating room, and my community. I have dedicated myself to the study of leadership through courses and books over the course of my career. Despite the improvements in surgical fellowship education that many in this room have contributed to, I still felt there was a gap in leadership development for our fellows. We took advantage of this opportunity to fill that gap by offering the inaugural ASMBS Leadership Academy to fellows. This was done this past year in conjunction with the weekend meeting in Vegas, and it was an incredibly rewarding and successful event. We invited 50 fellows in the country to participate in a unique format where not only they would be equipped with leadership skills, but would also get face time with our industry partners to learn about their latest cutting edge advancements. Based on feedback I continue to receive, this unique blending of industry partners and fellows resulted in an incredibly successful event for everyone that participated in it, industry partners and fellows alike. I encourage the Executive Council to make this a permanent part of our weekend meeting meeting for future fellows. Now, the ASMBS has an incredibly rigorous process for procedure endorsement. Not all procedures that have been brought forth in the past have been endorsed. However, based on the wealth of literature now available in conjunction with our Clinical Issues Committee and our Executive Council vetting process, I can tell you that the one anastomosis gastric bypass is now officially endorsed by the ASMBS. We look forward to safe rollout of this procedure on a larger scale within the U.S. As illustrated in this screenshot, even I can be swayed by data rather than dogma based on a comment from one of our newest members elected to the EC. I would like to thank Rich Peterson and other members of our communications committee who work tirelessly behind the scenes to keep our footprint present in the social media space as well as in online journal clubs but there is a subset of our society that still does not feel comfortable or familiar with our traditional means of social media for communications. I recommended to the Executive Council that we do a pilot with a company called DocMatter that targets a different demographic than traditional social media users, basically people my age. It also has an advisory board made up of respected leaders in our field and is actively monitored by the DocMatter staff to make sure only appropriate posts are made public and no patient identifiers are present when asking clinical questions. I'm pleased, pleased to say that we have over 3,900 of our total members currently enrolled and over 3,100 have, uh, are engaged members with these community discussions. This provides another venue, particularly for those in more rural or underserved areas, to be one click away from a nationally recognized thought leader in our field on advice on how to proceed with a challenging clinical scenario. I too have taken advantage of this platform to gain advice on how to treat patients. Based on the success of this initiative in just the last seven months, I am pleased to announce the Executive Council approved to continue to fund this program for another year as it has been 
proven to be a very important resource to membership within ASMBS. Five years ago, we had the opportunity to solicit, solicit the expertise of the National Opinion Research Council to get a finger on the pulse of society's views around the disease of obesity. We received a tremendous amount of press from that survey. We had an opportunity to repeat this in a post-pandemic world to see what the viewpoints of society are five years later. With the support of the ASMBS Foundation, we surveyed over 1,700 individuals. We learned that the public still considers obesity a threat equal to cancer, just like in the first survey. But we also learned that nearly a third of Americans said COVID made them more worried than ever about having obesity and was enough to prompt 28 million people to consider a method of weight loss that they had never tried before the pandemic, including approximately 6.4 million people who thought about having weight loss surgery or taking prescription obesity drugs for the first time in their lives. Worries about obesity were even higher among black and Hispanic adults, about 45% of whom were more concerned about obesity than ever before compared to 29% of all Americans. We will keep you posted on the final publication of these results and we hopefully will receive even more national press in the months to come. Our Diversity and Inclusion Committee, led by Pura Ma, Monique Hassan, and Farah Hussein, have initiated a program that I and others have been very excited to see launch. They've established the ASMBS Mentor Mentee Program. Now, I know I have relied heavily on my mentors in the field when I have been faced with difficult decisions. I'm confident this program will help many of our members as well. I look forward to seeing this program grow in the years to come, and I hope those of you who have been matched up take the opportunity to meet here in person in Dallas. I also want to recognize Dr. Stephanides and his research committee for all they have done to develop the ASMBS Research Collaborative, or from here to called ARC. I was thrilled to see over 200 MBSA QIP accredited centers desire to be part of this research collaborative. We have a unique opportunity by merging our MBS QIP data with more granular data mined from respective programs to improve the way we deliver care, particularly around challenging topics where we still have unanswered clinical questions. Two major questions in that field include optimal DVT prophylaxis as well as marginal ulcer prophylaxis. I look forward to seeing this research collaboration answer some of these challenging clinical questions that still plague us and will allow us to deliver even higher quality care to our patients. After 50 years as a specialty, the American Board of Surgery has finally recognized metabolic and bariatric surgery as a field worthy of focused practice designation. This is different than subspecialty boards examinations as one does not necessarily need to do a fellowship, but has developed focused expertise over years in practice. Under the leadership of Eric DiMaria and Jaime Ponce, with Rich Peterson and Wayne English overseeing the item writing committee, in less than a year, we had a high stakes exam available to our membership. Over 100 brave souls who qualified took this exam with a very high pass rate. Respected thought leaders, as well as myself, then went to Philadelphia to set the pass rate for this exam. As you can see in this picture, it was taken when we were halfway through grading the exam questions. And you can see from the smiles, those who felt confident they were going to pass. <laughs> I, on the other hand, was still on the bubble. No. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I'm very proud of this milestone for our specialty. It has been over a decade in the making. Certificates are in the mail for those who passed. And when I reflect on our society's achievements over the last 20 years, we have developed accreditation of our various programs representing the quality work that we do. We have certification of fellows as majority now seek a fellowship before embarking on a specialty. And now through the FPD examination process, we have validation of our specialty. FPD benefits to our society are significant and in some ways still to be determined as a day will hopefully come where patients will not only seek out their care at accredited centers, but will seek out FPD certified surgeons as well. I recognize there are challenges to who qualifies for the examination based on the American Board of Surgery stipulations. We are actively working through these issues with the board, and I would encourage all of our members to take this exam when it is offered next year. I also ask that you all think where you were in 1991. Now, please don't tell me some of you weren't born yet. <laughs> it's hard to believe that this was the year the World Wide Web was launched. 
Less significant was my college graduation. But it's hard to believe that we, as a society, still quote a 31-year-old document as our guiding principles for indications for metabolic and veritic surgery. It's time we abolish these outdated indications and update them. With the approval of the Executive Council, I commissioned Dan Eisberg and our Clinical Issues Committee to update this antiquated document. The updated document will have expanded indications for metabolic and bariatric surgery for lower BMI patients. It will also have a lower BMI conversion factor for those of Asian ethnicity, as well as a more comprehensive, expanded role for qualifying comorbid conditions, as well as for revisions. But the update of this document in and of itself is not enough. It will be up to you as the members to see it successfully transform the way we care for patients in the country and around the world. I look forward to Executive Council approval of this document. I am optimistic we will also have approval by the IFSO board so we can have one unified global message for patients and payers alike. I have approval from both senior editors of SWORD and obesity surgery, Drs. Raul Rosenthal and Scott Shakora, respectively, that a day will come when papers will not be accepted in either of our leading journals if the 1991 NIH guidelines are referenced. The 2022 ASMBS if so, guidelines for indications for metabolic and bariatric surgery must be referenced instead. Those of you on the front lines, as you complete your peer-to-peers for denied life-changing and life-saving surgeries, I ask you to challenge insurance companies who are quoting a 31-year-old document. Would they use a 31-year-old document for indications around stroke care or cardiology care? My guess is no, they most definitely would not. So we must do away with abiding by the 1991 statement and use contemporary evidence-based guidelines as outlined in this document moving forward. It will take this kind of grassroots efforts to change the tide and perception from payers as well as providers with our updated contemporary evidence-based indications for the care that we provide. The draft has been out for member comment for both ASMBS and if so members and I look forward to seeing this to fruition soon. In the time we have remaining, I'd like to talk about future directions that I feel we should also consider as a society. We have embraced a multidisciplinary approach for some time, but it is now time to embrace a multimodality approach to care. We must think about our disease much like we think about the treatment of the disease of cancer. We often use neoadjuvant therapy, followed by surgery, followed by adjuvant therapy to tackle various cancers. We must adopt this mindset and terminology with regards to metabolic bariatric surgery. Perhaps there are roles for neoadjuvant pharmaceutical intervention, followed by surgery, followed by adjuvant therapies, including endoscopic and pharmaceutical interventions that would maximize outcomes in our patients. We all know that obesity is not just a disease, but a chronic disease, and we must be able to treat it as such. When cancer has not returned, we refer to it as in remission. When cancer unfortunately does return, refer, we refer to it as recurrence. We certainly don't blame the patient. We need to approach our bariatric terminology in a similar fashion. We must begin to what I refer to as metabolically matching the patient's two procedures. Much like the stages of a polyp require various levels of intervention. With six endorsed metabolic bariatric surgeries with various metabolic impacts on the body balanced against various risks, it is time we begin to match our patient's severity of disease to the correct procedure over time. Our data is growing rich enough that the next frontier of research should be focused on understanding which patients would benefit the most from which procedures. In addition, as we have entered our millionth patient into our MBSA QIP database, we now have a mature enough database that it we have reached a steady state in terms of quality metrics for both gastric bypass and sleeve, currently the two most commonly performed procedures in the country. Even though we are constantly trying to improve our outcomes, data would support that we have reached a steady state where I believe we can begin setting outcome metrics and tying this to accreditation. If we do not manage this ourselves, payers will do it for us, and we've already seen examples of this in the past. And this is not about weaponizing our own data against us. It's about setting standards and holding ourselves accountable before the payers do it for us. 
I also don't believe it's time for us to strongly consider a direct-to-consumer marketing. It is a powerful tool and we need to do this collaboratively with all stakeholders at the table. Industry partners of mechanical device companies, endoscopic therapies, and pharmaceutical companies need to come together along with our advocacy groups under the umbrella of ASMBS, where we can share a well-crafted message directly to our potential patients. We know that marketing our life-saving and life-changing interventions to our primary care providers, endocrinologists, and other subspecialists who deal with the disease of obesity has fallen short of its goal. We need to empower the patients themselves to help make their own decisions. After all, we empower over 200,000 change agents every year. If we are truly going to move the needle in terms of expanding coverage to those that can benefit, we must take the initiative to do this ourselves. A rising tide indeed raises all boats. And this is the time when we must come together united, as I do think it is a, would be a powerful way to get our word out regarding what we do have to offer. If my office manager's four-year-old daughter can be influenced to become a surgeon after watching one video debate, just think how much influence we could have over the public's opinion if we had a powerful direct-to-consumer message. Finally, we need unity within the body of ASMBS. It is important to know that the enemies are not those in attendance at this meeting. We have discrimination. We have lack of coverage. We have people who believe obesity is a condition of volition rather than a disease. And we have non-evidence-based criteria that our patients must overcome in order to qualify for surgery. We must put aside our personal differences around our passion for various procedures and remain united in our cause. My father is from India and my mother is of European descent. If my parents, who came from such vastly different cultures and faiths, can learn to overcome their differences, why can't we? As you can see from my ancestry composition, I'm close to 50% each between my parents' lineage. But I am 100% ASMBS. <laughs> now those of you who know the history of ASMS will know that Dr. Fielding and I can agree to disagree over what procedure perhaps is best for certain patient populations. But I also want to tell you that I believe that my stance on some issues over the years has softened, and I do believe that his has as well. We have learned from one another. I can genuinely tell you that I consider him a friend. I hope others in this room can see past their differences and opinions and achieve healing by mending relationships so that we can all come together to better serve our patients, communities, and this country as a unified society. <clears throat> in closing, I've always been in awe of the women's Olympic team in the 4x400 relay. Every four years, it takes four individuals to complete their race. The individuals may change over time, but they always work as a team. It's very similar to a four-year term on the executive committee. Every year, the composition of people changes, but the goals for our society and our patients never does. Now it's time for me to pass the baton to Dr. Lemasters. I have confidence she will take our society to the next level while I sit on the sidelines, hands on my knees, exhausted, attempting to catch my breath. I'm excited to see the energy she will take as she leads ASMPS forward. She will certainly do it with more grace uh, and be able to do it and to control the helm on autopilot as seen on my boat here. This journey has been an amazing one when I would not trade for anything in the world. Last year, I had the privilege of returning to my fellowship roots, as you can see in this photo. Like the statue behind me, I might be a little more battered, bruised, and war-torn, and show the effects that experience and age has had on me. But still, I have no regrets, and as the EC is about to come and join us, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race and I have kept the ASMBS faith. You as the membership will be the judge of my presidency and I hope someday you can reflect and say, 
Well done, good and faithful servant of the ASMBS. I can tell you, friends, mentors, mentees, members of the ASMBS, my heart is full. My heart is full. Sean, on behalf of the ASMBS, I present you with the presidential plaque. Job well done.